In chapter 10, we're going to talk about muscle tissue. All muscle tissue is derived from mesoderm. Recall that muscle tissue accounts for more of your body weight than any other tissue type. There are certain characteristics of muscle tissue, such as excitability, which means that muscle cells possess polarized membranes and that polarity can change. Contractility, muscle cells can shorten. Extensibility, muscle cells can lengthen. And elasticity, muscle cells can recoil after shortening or lengthening. In this slide, you will see the various types of muscle tissue. The first one is skeletal muscle, which is found attached to bones and accounts for 40% of the body mass. You will note long, cylindrical shaped cells that are multinucleated with the nuclei peripherally located. Skeletal muscle is voluntary, possesses striations, has quick twitch with short contractions, in addition to many other functions of uh, skeletal muscle, which we will get to momentarily. The next muscle is smooth muscle tissue. Smooth muscle tissue is found throughout the body in the walls of hollow organs of the digestive tract, respiratory tract, urinary, and reproductive tracts. In addition, it is found within the walls of blood vessels and in the erector pili muscle of skin. The cells are short and spindle shaped, lack striations and intercalated discs, and have only a single nucleus per cell. They demonstrate slow twitch and long contractions. Smooth muscle moves food, urine, and reproductive secretions as well as controls the diameter of respiratory passageways and regulates the diameter of blood vessels. The third type of muscle tissue is cardiac muscle tissue, which is found only in the heart. The cells are short and branched, usually uninucleated, but occasionally can be binucleated. Cardiac muscle is involuntary, it also possesses striations like skeletal muscle, but has intercalated discs as well. Cardiac muscle possesses intermediate twitch with intermediate contractions. Cardiac muscle moves blood and maintains blood pressure. Here are the functions of skeletal muscle tissue. Skeletal muscle produces skeletal movements, maintains posture and body position, supports soft tissues, guards entrances and exits, exits of the body, maintains body temperature, and provides nutrient reserves. Make sure that you know the functions of skeletal muscle tissue. Here are the characteristics that I mentioned previously of skeletal muscle. And you should make sure that you also know the characteristics of skeletal muscle. One thing to note is that excitability is sometimes also referred to as irritability. And it does mean that skeletal muscle has the ability to respond to stimuli. You'll note on the slide it can respond to stimulation by nerves and hormones. Contractility and extensibility and elasticity are also noted here. Now let's look at the anatomy of skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscles are organs that are composed primarily of skeletal muscle tissue plus connective tissues, nerves, and blood vessels. On this slide, you can see the gross anatomy of skeletal muscle. A single skeletal muscle is composed of large bundles called fascicles. Each fascicle 
is composed of numerous muscle cells, which are also called muscle fibers because of their long cylindrical shape. Each muscle fiber is composed of myofibrils. And a myofibril is composed of two contractile proteins called myofilaments. We'll examine that in more detail in just a moment. Now the connective tissues are also associated with muscle tissue and in this slide you can see the epimyosome which is a dense layer of collagen fibers that surrounds the entire muscle. This tissue separates the muscle from surrounding tissues and organs and it's connected to the deep fascia which is a dense connective tissue layer. Perimyosin is a fibrous layer that divides the skeletal muscle into a series of bundle, bundles called fascicles. In addition to possessing collagen and elastic fibers, the perimyosin contains blood vessels and nerves that maintain blood flow and innervates the muscle fibers within the fascicles. And Endomyosome is a very delicate connective tissue that surrounds the individual skeletal muscle cells or fibers and loosely interconnects adjacent muscle fibers. At the ends of a skeletal muscle, the collagen fibers of the connective tissue layers merge to form either a bundle known as a tendon or a broad sheet which anchors the muscle to the bone. Now here you can see the myofibril that I mentioned earlier. And the myofibril is the contractile thread. Within the myofibril, we're going to further examine the anatomy of the sarcomere, which is shown in the figure. The sarcomere is considered to be the functional or contractile unit of skeletal muscle tissue. Each myofibril consists of approximately 10,000 sarcomeres, each with a resting length of about 2 micrometers. Each sarcomere is composed of a very specific arrangement of the myofilaments, actin and myosin. And in the slide you can see various regions or zones that are noted within the sarcomere. The A-band is the dense region of the sarcomere that contains overlapping thick and thin filaments. This contains both myosin and actin. Remember the myofibril is composed of contractile proteins too, which are called myofilaments. The thick myofilaments are called myosin and the thin myofilaments are called actin. One way to remember that is tin, thin, and then the other myosin is the thick. The myos myofilaments of myosin and actin are arranged in an overlapping pattern creating hundreds to thousands of functional units called sarcomeres. Now on either side of the A-band is an area that contains only thin filaments, actin, called the I-band. In the middle of each A-band is an area that contains only thick filaments, or myosin, called the H-band. The M-line, which is located in the middle of each H-band, anchors the central portion of each thick filament. And the Z-lines mark the boundary between adjacent sarcomeres. Z-lines consist of proteins called actinins, which anchor the thin filaments of adjacent sarcomeres. And here you can see the myofilament protein anatomy. So we can examine the thin filaments and thick filaments in a little bit more detail. The thin filament, which is actin, is composed of several interacting proteins. 
and you also have some regulatory proteins, tropomyosin and troponin. Tropomyosin is a double-stranded protein that covers over the active sites of G-actin in a resting muscle. This prevents the actin and myosin fibers from interacting. G-actin is a globular actin which is rounded, a compact molecule of protein that possesses an active site where one myosin molecule can bind. Troponin is a protein containing three globular subunits and is strategically placed along the tropomyosin. Each of the globular subunits possess an active site to bind to calcium ions. When calcium binds to troponin, troponin changes its shape, which in turn causes tropomyosin to swivel, thereby revealing the active site on the G-actin so that myosin and actin can form the cross bridge. The thick filaments are also shown on this slide. Each thick filament of myosin is composed of roughly 300 myosin molecules. Myosin molecules are made of a pair of myosin subunits twisted around each other, and it looks similar to a golf club, as noted on the slide. It has a head and a tail portion. The myosin subunits have a tail portion that are connected to the head, and the tail and head are connected by a hinge that allows the head to pivot at its base. The head contains some important parts of myosin. In particular, this is where actin binds, it's also where ATP binds, and the head contains ATPase enzymes. As you will see, ATP is required for the cross bridge formation to occur. Now here is the sarcomere, which as I noted is the functional unit of skeletal muscle. And you can see in a little more detail the regions that we discussed, the M line, the I band, the A band, and the Z line. Now, the sliding filament model is where the mind shows how the zones and regions overlap. When a sarcomere contracts, you'll note that the Z lines move closer together and the I band becomes smaller. The A band stays the same. At full contraction, the thick and thin filaments overlap. Another thing about the sarco um, sarcomere is the sarcolemma, which is the cell membrane. And the cell membrane is where the nerve contacts the muscle. It's the plasma membrane of a muscle cell. That is the sarcolemma. The sarcolemma possesses numerous invaginations that extend deep into the sarcoplasm at right angles to the cell surface. And those invaginations are called transverse tubules or T-tubules. The T-tubules form passageways through the muscle cell allowing electrical impulses generated at the surface to travel deep into the cell's interior. That allows the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium from the terminal cisternae. The sarcoplasmic reticulum, known as the SR, is similar to smooth endoplasmic reticulum of other body cells, forming a tubular network surrounding each myofibril. The membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum contains ion pumps that pump calcium ions from the cytosol into the sarcoplasmic reticulum where some of the calcium binds to a protein called calcequestrin. 
On either side of a T-tubule, the tubules of the sarcoplasmic reticulum enlarge, fuse, and form expanded chambers used for the storage of calcium ions called the terminal cisternate. One T-tubule plus the terminal cisterna located on either side of the T-tubule forms a triad which is shown in the diagram. Now before we get into the neuromuscular junction and the sliding filament model of contraction, we have to talk a little bit about what the resting membrane potential of a cell is. The resting membrane potential is an unequal distribution of charges on either side of the plasma membrane. And as you can see in the figure, we can measure the resting membrane potential using a voltameter. In general, there is a high concentration of sodium in the extracellular fluid and a low concentration of sodium in the intracellular fluid or cytosol. This difference in ion distribution contributes to the resting membrane potential of a cell and is maintained by the sodium-potassium pump. You will learn more about the sodium-potassium pump when we study the nerve system chapter in chapter 12. So let's talk about the physiology of skeletal muscle contraction. First, let's examine the neuromuscular junction and nerve stimulation. Skeletal muscle cells are stimulated by a motor neuron. The axon of each motor neuron branches extensively to form numerous cellular extensions called synaptic terminals. The synaptic terminals then interact with the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber at a specialized site called the neuromuscular junction. When the electrical impulse or action potential reaches the synaptic terminals, calcium channels within the synaptic terminal begin to open, causing calcium to rush into the axon terminal. And you will see as a result of this influx of calcium, the synaptic vesicles release the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, which can then fuse with the axon membrane, releasing the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft by exocytosis. So the sarcolemma has ACH receptors, and another thing that's noted here is acetylcholinesterase, which is in the synaptic cleft. Acetylcholinesterase is the enzyme that destroys acetylcholine, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. So here's a little more detail. The action potential arrives at the axon terminal, voltage-gated calcium channels open, calcium causes the synaptic vesicles to release their contents, the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, via exocytosis. Acetylcholine then diffuses across the synaptic cleft and attaches to receptors, also known as ion channels, on a highly folded region of the sarcolemma called the motor end plate. The binding of acetylcholine to the channels causes the channel to open and influx of sodium ions into the muscle cell which results in depolarization of the sarcolemma and eventually leading to an action potential in contraction, which you can see here. And acetylcholinesterase is important, as I noted previously, because it destroys acetylcholine, preventing continuous muscle contraction in the absence of nerve stimulation. 
Electrical conditions of the resting sarcolemma, also called the resting membrane potential, is said to be polarized. That is, the extracellular environment is more positive with respect to the inside of the membrane. The predominant ion is sodium, while the predominant intracellular ion is potassium. The sarcolemma is relatively impermeable to both ions while at rest, but more so to the sodium ion. So to get the muscle to contract, the membrane potential must depolarize. So again, the binding of acetylcholine to the sodium ion channels on the motor end plate causes the channels to open. Sodium then rushes rapidly across the sarcolemma into the cytoplasm. As sodium begins to accumulate on the inside of the muscle cell, the resting potential is decreased and local depolarization occurs. That is, a patch of sarcolemma immediately around the sodium channel becomes more positive inside with respect to the outside. And the action potential will propagate along the sarcolemma. The positive charge inside the patch of sarcolemma changes the permeability of an adjacent patch, opening sodium channels there. Consequently, the sodium begins to rush into the membrane, thereby causing the membrane potential in that region to decrease and depolarization occurs in that area. Thus, the action potential begins to travel rapidly away from the motor end plate across the entire sarcolemma and then down into the T-tubules, which you can see here. And that allows calcium ions to be released from the terminal cisterna of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the action potential at the neuromuscular junction signals acetylcholine release. Acetylcholine opens sodium channels which depolarizes the membrane. The action potential spreads through the sarcolemma the T-tubules spread the action potential into each sarcomere, down through the deep into the cell's interior. Calcium ions are then released, which signals muscle contraction. We'll get to the steps of excitation contraction coupling in just a moment, which will lead to the sliding filament mechanism. Now, repolarization of the sarcolemma also has to occur. Immediately after the depolarization wave passes, the sarcolemma's permeability changes once again. Acetylcholine is removed from the synaptic cleft by acetylcholinesterase, causing the sodium ion channels to close while the potassium channels to finally open in a delayed response. The influx of sodium now stops, but potassium begins to leak out so that the outside of the membrane switches back to positive and the inside of the membrane becomes more negative. This restores the charge across the membrane, which is known as repolarization. However, because more potassium ions eventually leave than is necessary, the membrane can become hyperpolarized. And you can see the channels closing and opening here. The sodium potassium pump restores this ion concentration in the hyperpolarized membrane to reach the polarized conditions of the resting membrane potential. For each ATP that we use, three sodium ions are pumped out and two potassium ions are pumped back in.
And you again will learn more about the sodium potassium pump and the steps in an action potential in a little more detail in chapter 12 when you cover the nervous system. So to summarize what we covered so far, depolarization and transmission of the action potential goes through the T-tubules, opening the sarcoplasmic reticulum's calcium channels, increasing the concentration of cytosolic calcium, and now what we're going to examine is how calcium interacts with troponin which will change the conformation of tropomyosin, exposing actin's active site. We need actin and myosin to interact along with ATP in order to get the muscle to contract. So recall, as the action potential propagates along the sarcolemma, it moves down the T-tubules, the transmission of the action potential past the triads causes the terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium into the sarcoplasm, where it now becomes available to the myofilaments of the sarcomere. The presence of calcium on the sarcomere causes myosin to bind to actin in a process commonly referred to as the sliding filament mechanism. The attachment of myosin cross bridges with an arresting muscle is inhibited by the presence of tropomyosin, which remember covers the active sites on the G-actin. If calcium ions are released from the terminal cisternae by the action potential, they bind to troponin, changing its shape. Troponin then pulls on the tropomyosin so that the binding sites on actin are exposed. Once the active site is exposed, the high-energy myosin heads attach to the actin for the cross-bridge formation. The release of ADP plus phosphate from the high-energy myosin head causes the head to pivot and bend as it pulls on the actin filament, sliding it towards the midline. This is sometimes referred to as the power stroke and is equivalent to the contraction of the muscle. And you can see that here in the figure. As the new ATP attaches to the now low-energy myosin head, the myosin head will detach from actin. ATP is split to form ADP plus phosphate and the bond energy is transferred to the myosin head causing it to move in the high energy position, position which is sometimes referred to as cocked or reactivated so that it's ready to bind to the actin binding site once again. When the action potential dissipates, calcium is reabsorbed back into the terminal cisternae. When this occurs, tropomyosin moves back over the active sites on G-actin so the cross-bridge formation can no longer occur and the muscle relaxes. So the contraction cycle begins when we have an increase in calcium. The active sites are exposed. Calcium interacts with troponin, causing a conformational change in tropomyosin, exposing actin's active site. The cross bridge forms. Myosin heads attach to actin at the active site. The myosin heads pivot. Remember there's ATPS, ATPase activity in the myosin head causing the myosin head to pivot resulting in the movement of the actin filaments towards the Z-disc 
Then the attached ADP and phosphate are released. Cross bridges detach, a new molecule of ATP then attaches to the myosin head, causing the cross bridge to detach. And the myosin head is said to be reactivated. The myosin head hydrolyzes ATP to ADP and phosphate, which returns the myosin to the cocked position. And here is a summary of those steps that we just went through, showing skeletal muscle contraction. Now the other thing about skeletal muscles that we want to talk about is muscle metabolism. And muscle contraction requires large amounts of ATP that may be produced either aerobically or anaerobically. Mitochondrial activity is the ultimate source of energy required by active skeletal muscle cells. In order to provide energy for contraction, skeletal muscles will use stored ATP. Your muscles store very limited amounts of ATP, which provide enough energy for approximately a couple of seconds of isometric contractions, or the equivalent of about 10 twitches but ATP is rapidly broken down into ADP and phosphate so it must be regenerated quickly. Your muscles can then tap into creatine phosphate and there is much more creatine phosphate that can be stored by skeletal muscles rather than ATP. You only make one ATP per creatine and this would be good for an additional 15 seconds or about 70 more twitches. If the muscles still need energy for contraction, they can use glycogen, either anaerobically or aerobically. Glycogen via the anaerobic pathway is also called glycolysis and this results in two ATPs per glycogen. This process is good for about 130 seconds or about 670 twitches. The anaerobic metabolism of glycogen also produces lactic acid which accumulates in the muscle and can cause soreness in your muscles. Soreness is also caused in your muscles from the muscles producing small tears in them, which will be repaired over time. And that is responsible for the soreness you might feel the next day, for example. Now, your muscles can also use glycogen via an aerobic pathway, which is called the citric acid cycle, also known as the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. Oxygen is required for this process, but we can generate quite a bit of ATP, approximately 36 ATPs, can be produced from glycogen via the aerobic pathway. So this process generates enough ATP for about 2400 seconds, or about 12,000 twitches. And Aerobic respiration takes place in the mitochondria. Glycolysis takes place in the cytosol. So your muscle metabolism goes through these series of steps depending on the amount of energy they need for a contraction. Now cardiac muscle was introduced in the beginning of this chapter and you will learn more about cardiac muscle when you study the cardiovascular system in A and P2. One thing to note about cardiac muscle, which is 
identified histologically when examining cardiac muscle are intercalated discs. And they are part of the cardiac muscle sarcolemma and contain gap junctions and desmosomes. This allows cardiac muscle to work as a unit. Again, you will learn more about cardiac muscle when you study the cardiovascular system later. Finally, there are some muscle disorders that you should be familiar with. Hypertrophy is an enlargement of stimulated muscle. The number of fibers within the muscle does not change significantly, but instead each muscle fiber increases in diameter. An example would be bodybuilders from the way their muscles can enlarge via extensive training. Atrophy is another muscle disorder that can result from lack of use of a muscle, which causes the muscle to become flaccid and lose tone and power, as well as decrease in diameter. If you have ever suffered a broken bone and you wore a cast for a while, your muscles probably went through some form of atrophy. Rigor mortis is sustained muscle contractions that occur after death due to the loss of ATP in the muscle. Remember, without ATP, the myosin actin cross bridge cannot detach, which results in a prolonged contraction. This process begins two to seven hours after death and can depend on environmental factors and disappears after one to six days or when the body begins to decompose.